Hi, David. Um, where's Susan? Well, since today was her birthday and her day off, I basically sent her out to a resort for the day so that she can relax. Well, that's awful. But wait, what about the whole depression issue? I already told her. That's another reason I sent her out to the resort, so that she could spend her day off away from me. You know you're gonna have to have a talk about that later, right? Oh, of course. But until then, I'm just gonna review the Shaman movie. Giratina and the Sky Warrior. Oh boy. When it comes to this film, the reception seems to be split down the middle. Some people like it, others hate it. Hell, back in the top 15, I put that film pretty low on the list and didn't have nice things to say about it. But by this point, my opinions on those movies have drastically changed since doing this show, so I think it's time I gave an updated opinion of it. So without any further delay, let's begin. After our obligatory World of Pokemon recap, our film begins with Dialga from the last film arriving at a lake. But Dialga isn't the only legendary at that lake. A little hedgehog with a flower is also there. This is Shaman, one of the final three legendaries in the Sinnoh Pokedex. And also one of the forgettable ones, but I digress. So after we get introduced to them, we also get introduced to Giratina, another Gen 4 legendary, as he grabs onto Dialga and shoves him into the distortion world. It's the reverse world. Guys, they're basically the same thing. Both of Giratina's domain, both serve as the balance of the real world. They're basically the same thing. As such, I'm going to call it Distortion World for the rest of the review because, honestly, that's what it is to me. But introductions aren't done yet, it seems, as we also get introduced to Zero, our antagonist for this film, observing Giratina's actions. As for Shaman, she gets dragged into Giratina's world accidentally and gets thrown around like a rag doll while the two deities fight. While that's going on, we get introduced to another character, Newton Graceland and Shieldon, as they observe the fighting. Speaking of which, while that fight's going on, poisonous clouds appear in the world and Shaman accidentally absorbs one using its abilities. But once that is done, he uses a seed flare to open up a portal to the real world and escapes. Dialgan notices this, and after a failed attempt, thanks to Giratina, it's able to escape through said portal and put Giratina in a time loop so that he can't follow him. So after all that shit, we get introduced to Ash's group eating their breakfast. Or rather, preparing to eat their breakfast because before they could even sit down, Shaman, who after escaping the distortion world was sent down stream thanks to River, shows up and eats their pancakes. Wow, I hate this character already, and we're not even 20 minutes into the film. Good job! Speaking of... Of, Shaman decides to be an even bigger dick by shaking his sturdy body around Ash's group, biting Ash and some of their Pokemon, knocking over their barbecue, absorbing the fumes, and then using Seed Flare hurting them in the process. Thankfully, they call Shaman out on this, except for Dom, but whatever. But Shaman still acts like a little shit and tells him to take her to that place. Yeah, this character loves to be vague as hell at points. Since this shit goes on for far longer than it needs to be, I'll address it now to save a lot of time. That place is at the top of the mountain near the area Ash's group is currently in. It has Grisidia flowers, the Adam transforms Shaman into its sky form, and Shaman needs to get there so that it can basically fly for the rest of its kind. That's the gist of it. So on their way to the mountain, they come across a garden with triangle-shaped statues. As they make their way through said garden, However, one of the statues creates a portal into the distortion world, and all of them, except Brock, are sucked in. Oh, and so is Team Rocket, but they hardly do a lot in this film. Uh, again. Seriously, movies, why are you even adding these guys into the film if you're not gonna do much with them? Even comedy-wise, this film's source of comedy doesn't even come from them. It's mostly from Shaman, for better or worse. So again, what is is the point of including them. So inside the distortion world, we get to see a lot of interesting elements this film has in animated form, such as the changing gravity, the different designs of the buildings when compared to the ones in the main world. The coloring is a lot different. It looks like a pretty interesting world to be in if you ignore that giant freaking dragon that may or may not eat you. But speaking of fascination, Newton shows back up and helps our heroes in finding a way out of this dimension. On the way to the portal, however, Newton reveals that he is a scientist and even explains that the poisonous clouds we saw in the beginning are are the after effects of Dialga and Palkia's battle in the last movie, causing time and space to be distorted. Oh, so basically Shane was absorbing distortion? Huh. Fascinating. Anyways, Asher's group manages to escape the distortion world, but as they explain what happened to Brock, Zero overhears this and heads over to their location, realizing that Giratina wants Shaman's power. So Asher's group gets on a train, and during the ride, they run into a group that has some of the flowers Shaman is looking for, and transforms into its sky form. Anyone else notice Alan Form's softer timid personality has a feminine voice, but the sky form is more brave, outgoing, and has a male sounding voice? Isn't that kind of gentle stereotyping? Eh, probably. But since I'm not qualified to talk about that kind of shit, we're just gonna move on. 
So after the transformation, Zero's army of Magnemites attack the train, but Ash's group disperses them with ease. Once they get off the train, they get on a boat to finish the journey. Meanwhile with Zero, he is currently watching a video from when he and Newton were exploring the Distortion World. Oh, right, I haven't talked about Zero's plan yet, have I? Well, basically, he wants to take over the Distortion World. What? Like on the bitch about how cliche it is? As tempting as it is... No. This character left so little of an impression on me that I couldn't even care much about what his plans are. Which may actually be worse than bitching about a cliche it is because he's the villain in all this. He's supposed to make an impression on the audience. So after all this goes down, Giratina shows up again and sucks them into the distortion world. Zero decides to follow them into the portal and eventually captures our heroes using his magnemites. Also, Shaman reverted back to its original form because as the film states, if Shaman touches his eyes or the sun is gone, it'll cancel out the sky form. How convenient. So Noon reveals that Zero used to be his colleague, and then Giratina charges at the group, trying to get Shaman. But then Shaman uses Seed Flare, allowing all of them to escape. Noon then explains to Shaman that he thinks the reason Giratina was after it was because its Seed Flare could return Giratina's ability to travel between the two worlds. So yeah, Giratina wasn't really evil after all. Why does that sound familiar? But after that scene, Zero captures Giratina using a weapon on his ship, and begins draining its energy in order for him to access the distortion world. It is then revealed that Newton created that machine, but eventually deleted the blueprints for it because he realized it could kill Giratina. So how is Zero using this machine, you may ask? Well, according to Newton, Zero never forgot about it. Huh, so he has a photographic memory then. Interesting. So after Zero hops onto his machine, while leaving his freaking hover device behind, Ash's group takes advantage of Zero's stupidity by using it to get up to his ship. So Ash's group battles Zero's Pokemon, while Newton goes into the ship to shut down the capture program, and they eventually succeed in freeing Giratina. Though Newton had to shut down the power and the engines of the ship to do it. Whoops. But at this point, Giratina is almost dead. So what do they do? Well, Shaman decides to use aromatherapy on Giratina, and it worked, surprisingly. Giratina thanks Ash and his group for saving him. Shaman is no longer afraid of Giratina. All seems good, right? Well, no. Zero, deciding to not give up, opens a portal into the distortion world. Oh, for the love of- Are you serious right now? You just basically had the climax. Zero got defeated by the good guys. Giratina is free and doesn't need our heroes. Shaman is at the location where it needs to be and isn't scared of Giratina. It's over! So I have the equivalent of another climax where they have to stop Zero again! Especially when all that's different here is that Giratina gets to beat Zero and the rest of our heroes have to stop an iceberg with Regigigas' help. A legendary Pokemon, I might add, that wasn't even mentioned up until this point in the film! Hell, in both climaxes, Ash and his supporting characters help down in saving the day, so it can't be to make them relevant. So because because this part is a waste of time, I'm ending it here. Overall, as a story, it's okay. I like that they at least attempted to tie in the events of the last movie to this one, since after all, this is supposed to be part of a trilogy. Now granted, Dialga pretty much screws off after the first act, but still, nice to see them attempting to have the two films together. I like the connection between Newton and Zero. I like that the other characters got to be useful in the final act, similar to Rise of Darkrai. However, I did not like the final part of this film since it felt really pointless, and I didn't like how they essentially reused the whole dark menacing guy wasn't really the bad guy shtick from the last movie. Granted, it's not the worst story I've seen in these movies thus far. I'd gladly take this over Destiny Deoxys' shit story any day, but it's just okay. As for the characters, they're also just okay. Giratina was harmless, and he served his purpose when the plot needed to. Zero was really forgettable as a villain, so much to the point that I couldn't even care about his plan largely because while watching this film, no matter what he did, whether it be his actions, his plans, or even his voice, I wasn't interested one bit. So if I'm not interested in this character, why should I care about him or his plans? Hell, before re-watching this film again, I completely forgot about this character's existence. Yet, I can still remember other villains from earlier in the films and later in these movies. That's how bad he is to me as a villain. I already bitched about Team Rocket earlier on, so I won't repeat myself when it comes to them. I thought Newton was okay, I thought Ash's group was okay at best, and I like that they at least did something in the finale. And then we have Shaman. When it comes to Shaman's landform, I hated her a lot. I hate her, I'm better than everyone else and they should do whatever I say, personality that comes out at points. She's annoying as all hell. I hate how she treats the other characters in this movie, especially with Ash. I did not like her landform one bit. I know some may throw out the defense that at least it's different than the other films where the legendaries are uber nice and cute. And to be fair, they're right. But here's the thing. If I find a legendary too cutesy and bland, like Mew, 
I will complain. If I find a legendary to be a gigantic dick, I will complain about that as well. Just because you swap out one extreme for another extreme, it does not make the problem go away. Because an extreme, regardless of if it's too nice or mean, is still there. The only thing I really liked about the landform of this character was when it got called out by the other characters. That's really about it. As for its sky form, it's a little better in terms of personality and the interactions with other characters, but that's about it. In terms of the sky form, it's fine. I'm okay with that character. But land form, <laughs> not so much. So now that I've complained about the characters and story, is there anything in this film that I like? Well, yes. The animation for this film is really good, and I really do like the music in this film. When it comes to the animation, I think they did a decent job of the character models as well as the CG. Granted, it's not as great as the previous one, but that's a pretty high bar to reach in terms of these movies. I think the coloring and backgrounds look good. I think the effects look good, especially in the distortion world. I think it really helps sell how different it is in comparison to the main Pokemon world. And as for the music, I think it does a good job with being fitting for the scenes it's used for. I like the variety of tunes and instruments utilized and they have a nice tempo and beat. So, good job, composers. But I think it's time I wrap this up. Overall, I think your Team in the Sky Warrior is an okay movie. While I do take issue with the story at points as well as its characters, it still does a good job with the animation, the parts of the story that aren't a problem to me, the soundtrack, etc. I still prefer Rides of Darkrai over this because I feel that film does a better job with its story and characters, but this is still an okay movie, and it's a lot better than I initially said it was back in the top 15. So give it a shot. So that concludes this review. I'm the Mountie, and next time we meet, we'll be concluding the Diamond and Pearl trilogy with Arceus and the Jewel of Life. See you then.